Hi, everybody. Welcome in. I'm on vacation, but before I left, I had the opportunity to sit down with perhaps the smartest guy I've ever met involved with sports, Peter Guber. He co-owns four professional teams, most notably the Warriors and the Dodgers and LAFC and Team Liquid Esports. That one I didn't know about. He's also been involved in some of the biggest movie successes of all time. Movies that have made $3 billion worldwide. Rain Man, Batman, The Color Purple, Terminator 2, Judgment Day, Boys in the Hood, A Few Good Men, Sleepless in Seattle. I view him as a genius, and I say that about very few people. It's interesting, before we get to Peter, I thought about this, is that I'm a big believer that when you win a championship in sports, you make changes. Because it's very human, very natural for a player after they win a title, a Super Bowl, a World Series, an NBA championship to pull back a little on focus and ambition. So it's imperative the organization does not. But the Warriors are the rare team that I'm not sure I'd make any move until perhaps next year's trading deadline. Kayvon Looney, how much do I want to pay him with James Wiseman, the former number two pick behind him? Let's bring in Peter Guber. His brain is substantial. His resume is awe-inspiring, and he joins us now. First of all, Peter, we love having you. Uh, um, just picking your brain on this stuff. I, I was thinking as I was driving today to do this that you've been involved in so many successful businesses, but sports has always been different um, because it, there's such a, 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 an emotional, visceral connection to it. So when you decide to invest in a sports franchise are there a list of do's and don'ts or or do you view it differently than other investments the most important thing is you don't want to be a fan a fan it only costs you like 30 bucks you just go to the game pay the ticket and you're a fan you know you can yell at them you can scream at them you have any opinion you want nobody listens to you everybody listens to you and it doesn't matter you're you're, you're you know, a passenger. When you decide to acquire a franchise, you're you're renting it in a sense. You are the steward for it. You, you, the idea of the ownership, the word ownership is a funny word. You don't own the players. You own the opportunity. You own the franchise. You own the right to help manage the organization to its hopefully its success and, and kind of steer it away from its failures, whether it's on the ice, it's on the field, on the turf, on the pitch, on the court, wherever it is. So you have, you have to have your attitude correct. And what you have to bring to it, if you're going to acquire that kind of an opportunity, is you have to bring to it a steely reserve. You have to be organized in a way that your authenticity shines through. And for your authenticity to shine through to the athletes, to the, to the coaches, to the people involved, to the fans, you have to align your feet tongue, heart, and wallet. They have to be going the same direction. And that takes right. a little bit of a good balance because you can get lost in the ego of it all. You can get lost in the idea that somehow that, you, you know, you, you, you're responsible for everything on the field and everything on the pitch or the ice. Well, you are, but you aren't. You, you, you have the opportunity to be the guidance counselor for the whole process. And so if you begin that journey with the idea that you're your, you don't, your ownership is renting. You're renting it for a number of years and you want to leave the organization better for your stewardship than you found it. And that's really the attitude that I brought to the things that I've uh, uh, joined with or participated in or owned. You, you never want to be a meddling owner, but being a producer or a sports owner, you have access to people. And if at any point you thought, ah, oh, this doesn't feel right, our direction we're not aligned. This movie feels off. I, I, they're not getting along. The director's not seeing it. How do you, without meddling, offer wisdom and, and sage advice? Because these are actors and performers, and they live in a tunnel of criticism to begin with. They're sensitive. So are coaches who are, you know, directors. They're public-facing people. Is it hard sometimes to to balance that, I want to offer something, but not overstep my boundaries. 
Yeah, I, I think that's it's well said. I think you have to you have to frame your involvement in the right way. You have to know who your audience is. Is it the coach? Is it the fans? Is it the co co investors? Is it the uh, team players? Whoever it is, you have to know who your audience, who you're speaking to, and you have to understand that you have to not just get their attention. You have to merit their attention. You know, you you have to you have to those are elements you actually earn it's not reputation but it's behavior and reputation that that you build a sense of trust that you you can have a conversation with the people that uh expresses your point of view whether it's the concessions or whether that's the wardrobe of the movie or the wardrobe of the of the players or whether it's the behavior off the court or on off the field of the players, all of which reflect on your team. So it's like an orchestra leader. You have to orchestrate all those things, but you don't want to be the orchestra leader in front of the orchestra. You're, you're out of the frame of the of the of the audience. You're, you're you're you you have to be happy and content with the fact that you're trying to manage a process. You aren't on camera as the star or the player, and you got you get people get confused they're, they they get that three letter word out of order ego ego edging god out and then what happens is they begin to think they are the performer they are the star they are the team no you have to look at it uh, somewhat differently because you keep your objectivity that way and you're able to make hard decisions that way too and if you can't make the hard decisions you're going to make bad decisions because you're going to have to make hard decisions you know i look at your resume peter You've dealt with Tom Hanks, Meg Ryan, Tom Cruise, Steph Curry, Draymond Green, um, a variety of personalities. Yeah. But is there a common thread? Clayton Kershaw, Mookie Betts. Is there a common thread that you seek when you invest or you're in a business that's attractive to you? Well, you know, the idea is um, I like presenting narrative stories. You're a narrative person. You present your story. You could just say, you know, the Red Sox won, the Yankees won five to two. I mean, you could give them the information, but it's it's all the color, the nuance to bring your audience into the equation, whether your audience is a movie star or an audience in the film theater or whether it's a... Uh, somebody on a basketball court, wherever it is, you're always dealing with the idea of what is the movie? What is the picture? What is the story you're trying to get across? And so in each of each of these businesses, you're dealing with personalities that themselves are the on court or on screen individuals. I mean, you know, just came upstairs from a film we're shooting with Ben Affleck and Matt Damon and the two giant stars. And you watch them and you realize you can't coach them to be better actors. You can't really go there and say to them, you know, why don't you do this differently? You have to organize yourself through other people to get your ideas across. You have to, you have to, you have to be um, smart enough to know when to hold them and when to fold them with movie people or television people or music people, all of whom I'm involved mm -hmm. with, and with with sports folks, whether it's you know, on the court or on the field or in the training room. So sometimes the best way to go about it is to whisper quietly to somebody who can pass the message on to somebody's creative. Because remember, that on-camera personality, and you're an on-camera personality, you, and I mean this respectfully, they have ego, E-G-O. And you got to re remember, you've got to, you got to make it their idea. You got to try to make them own it because if they don't own it they won't be authentic if they're not authentic they won't present well to their audience whether it's an actor or a basketball player or a football player they're all they're all personalities how they how they interact and how they present themselves is what you have on the screen whether it's a television screen in a sports event or whether it's a movie or a television show and so the idea that that um somehow you understand that process of connection uh, as a leader. I think it's important. I think people running sports businesses must understand that they are in the entertainment business. If they don't think they're in the entertainment business, that's called stupid. You know, they have to be in the entertainment business. They're aiming at people's hearts, not their heads first, their hearts. They're trying to make that audience, that sports people, 
as invested in the experience, invested in the outcome, and they're trying to make them participants, not passengers. You know, you make a di- if you think about the two differences in the businesses, you want to make the person that is in the sports business, the audience watching it, you want to make them participants you, because they feel they make a difference in the outcome. They actually right. feel they make a difference in the outcome. And they do. Now, nobody makes a difference in the outcome for Top Gun. Ah, oh, save Tom Cruise. You know, you could have 10,000 people in an outdoor arena cheering one way. It doesn't have any impact on the result of the film. But it does in the involvement of sports people. So you have to understand the audiences are different. And because they're different, and because the organizational participation is different, you have to make them participants. You have to try to make them have ownership over those players and that team. If they don't have ownership, they're not going to do word of mouth. They're not going to root. They're not going to come back time and time again. And that's the difference. You know, in a, in a sports event, you go to the event, you love the team, you love the players. You, you go 10 times, 12 times, 20 times. You watch it on television 30 times. Nobody goes to a move the same movie more than once or twice. Maybe what? Maybe they'll see it again later in, the, in a motel when they're traveling. But the point is, you create ownership in sports teams, and so you have to make them own the brand, own the core of the meaning of the team, own the venue. That's their temple. That's where they go to. So you have to. Nobody has nobody has the Lowe's Theater as their temple or the. Or right. Let's go down to the. Ever hear anybody say, "Let's go down to the AMC Theater"? They don't say that. Oh, let's go down to see the AMC theater. The film came in on budget. No, they don't do that. So the idea right. of ownership is what you have to do as a steward of these assets is you have to surrender it to your audience. You have to help them own it, not you. The um, When you were working with Tom Cruise in Rain Man, which is a top 10 movie for me all time. At mm-hmm. the time I lived in Vegas. So it was really, I knew that escalator at Caesars. I knew those places. <laughs> I was a young kid in my, you know, late twenties, probably early twenties. Um, Tom Cruise is going to make over a billion dollars with Top Gun. Did you know that he was different, that he was wired differently, that he would be what many people believe is one of the last remaining movie stars. Matt Damon's one of those Ben Affleck. There's not a lot, Peter. There's, there's a handful. Did you sense, boy, this kid's wired differently. You know, yes, I did. I'd seen him in a little tiny piece of a film that Franco Zeffirelli did for us, um, uh, Endless Love, you know, a little small part in it. And he was already magical. He was already had that magic thing. You know, you could see it. It's like it's like when you saw uh, a Brad Pitt in, in the back of Thelma and Louise, you know, and when, when, you, when you saw him there, he was in a scene for like four minutes and you went, whoa, give me that. What's that guy? So they have that special electric quality, that unique presence that just shines through the screen that I know he'd be that this kind of enduring star, an enduring star that goes through generations. No, and that would be that'd be too much. Did I know he had magnetic quality? Absolutely. And, you know, when he came to us afterwards and did another pretty good film, A Few Good Men with Jack Nicholson, I mean, it was phenomenal. He kept. He kept his stardom focused on two things. He knew what he would do well. And most of the films he chose, he knew they were him and he could do them well. You know, so th- right. that, that was, you know, part of his skill set. He's, he's an extraordinary guy that way. And he works like the deuce. I mean, he works his parts and his pictures like crazy, as does the great athletes we see, the really great athletes. They really work it. They, they care about it. So these are the performers that people want to see in the venues, on the screen, on the television. They want to see people that are just magnetic and committed to their art form. And I believe you can see it early on. You do see it early on with, 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 with performers and actors. They have that special skill. Why aren't they making more of them? Oh, that's a good idea. Why aren't they making more of Michael Jordan's? Why aren't they making more of this one and that one? Well, that's what they're called a star because there's only a few of them, you know? Right. And that's the truth. You know, the Murdoch family got out of the movie business and Barry Diller at the time, these are two smart people, said, you know, it may be time. People aren't going to theaters, the streaming business eating away. Um, You know, the world's changed. When you look at the movie business going forward, I mean, again, Tom Cruise feels like this is an outlier, a one-of-one movie, Top Gun, the remake, right? Or, Or Top Gun, the second. 
uh, iteration of it. What do you make of the movie business today? What, 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 if I didn't know much about it and you were explaining what it's going through, what would that be? I would think it's going through contortions right now because it's trying to figure out the storytelling business is never going away. There was a thing 50,000 years ago, it's called a campfire with flickering images. It still exists today. So the storytelling is never going away. It's going to get more and more expansive. The question is, what's the modality of telling those stories in, in film, television, streaming, or whatever? The idea of that going away is wrong. It'll never go away. What it will do is be, being reshaped now. Because now to get people to, to choose a film 2.4 days before they go, gather 3.2 people, travel 19.4 travel miles, wait 20.4 minutes to see, see the film, and then do that whole thing to go home, that's hard. That's a theatrical movie business. It's got to be an event. It's got to be something to get their bums off the seats and to go to a, a theater for a communal experience. Right. But more people are watching films today than ever in history. Of course, there are more people too, but more people are watching films. They're watching them on, 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 on streaming, on thumb drives, all kinds of things, on mobile phones. I mean, just, just the whole ch change of it. But when you have a monumental event like Top Gun became that one. And I think Christmas Avatar, James Cameron's new film is going to be that. And other ones, they become events. People want to gather and watch the experience together. Those are very hard to make. You know, they, they, they're, they are called another word, hits. And that's very hard to make. You know, you say, why, why don't we just make hits? Oh, why didn't I think of that? That's all I want to make from now on. I'm only going to make hits. <laughs> it's crazy. So you have fewer films. In that category, there'll always be some, and the people still want to gather together, and they do want to see them. I think that be, and there'll be more and more films made online, streaming, and other kinds of forms like that. And the idea that sports is completely different, really completely different, because sports, you as an audience love the live sports where you are there because you feel you make a difference, and you do. And you yeah. are part of the action and you do. And you don't know the ending. You know, the same right. guy wins all. You watch Rocky one on a big wide screen with a thousand people. You see who wins. You watch him three weeks later, you come back with your kid, same guy wins. Now you watch it in a plane flying across the country, same guy wins. Now you watch it on your on your phone, same guy wins. That's not true about sports. That's the that's the beauty of it, you know, the, the variegation of the result. So for me, I like. I like the mixes too. I'm doing a movie now about Sonny Vaccaro and and uh, right. I here, can't wait. Sonny Vaccaro and David Falk and all the people. Like, oh. I'm doing that. I'm doing that movie now. I'm shooting at the same time a movie in New Orleans called Heart of the Lion. It's the story of George Foreman coming back at 46 to win the heavyweight championship of the world, and he's down there with Forrest Whitaker and the whole cast. They're shooting the same two 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 different movies. I would tell you, everyone knows the ending of the movie, but they don't know how it happened or how come. You know, we just finished the Warriors um, game. We know everything about how and when it ended. You know what I mean? But the idea is the movie is a different thing than a sports event. It's just different. Yeah. And you engage audiences differently. You even organize, honestly, you organize the components differently to it too, because, you know, uh, most of the time when you make a movie, the result is an unexpected. I remember when I was running Sony, uh, Akiyomura said, Ubisan, why do you have to make the flops? Oh, I said, oh, right, just make hits. What a strategy. I'll just make the hits. Because people don't realize that chance has a lot to do with whether a movie or a television show is successful. It, it does. It has a lot to do with it. And it does in sports, but you're seeing it in real time in sports. You're, you're involved with it. You're participating with it. You're not a passenger. And that's the difference. You know, years ago, I'm from the Pacific Northwest. There's a story that's fairly well chronicled now um, up in Seattle that the Microsoft guys um, took an interview years ago with Jeff Bezos when he was had this idea of Amazon. And he was looking for some money and some support. And we're talking Gates and the late Paul Allen, really, really Steve Ballmer level intelligence. And almost to a person... Um, many of these 
Microsoft millionaires at the time. That's when people weren't billionaires yet. Even the Microsoft guys were millionaires. When they met Bezos, I was told by somebody I trust that was in the inner circle that they came back saying that may be the smartest person I've ever talked to in Jeff Bezos and how he laid it out, that you are dealing in a very high, not only net worth, but high functioning, high intelligent circle. Um, is there anybody, Peter, that you sit down with occasionally and on your drive back home, you're like, oh boy, she was smart or he was smart. Are you ever blown away by an idea or a person? Yeah, I, I, I'm always, I'm impressed with creativity and intelligence and passion. You know, I mean, that, 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 that combination. And it's like obscenity. You know it when you see it. You know, you just feel it. It just, it just, it just, just it radiates from you, and you're sucked in by it and seduced by it often. You know, and and uh, you know, I remember um, um, meeting Steve Jobs when I was at Sony, running Sony, and um, and this was before he exploded, so to speak, as, as super success, super super successful. And I thought to myself, wow. That guy is smart, really smart. I mean, really, really smart. I remember just recently, a, a few years back, was sitting with Elon Musk at a dinner party next to him at a private house. And I met him several times, but in talking with him, he was talking about this whole concept of uh, electric cars and how it worked and what it meant. And he said something that was you know, many things that were just, I, mean, I couldn't even eat dinner. I just sat there and listened. I remember when he told me one thing, he says, what's the most awful thing you like doing about driving? He says, I said, standing at the gas station for 11 minutes, pumping gas into my car with the meter going like that, spending the, spending the money and nothing to look at. Just standing there and going around, maybe worrying about getting robbed or something, but that was it. He says, going to get rid of that. It's gone forever. You never have to do that again. You know, I said, really? He said, yep. He says, it's electric cars, you drive 300 miles, plug it in at home, go the next day. Oh, I like that. You know, it just, it was like, you know, it's like, and you looked in his eyes and you knew he got it. He knew that was one of the promises of it. I mean, that was a side piece of the promise, obviously, but he understood his audience. He understood his customer. He understood them as, as a participant in his process. And he could speak to them about what they want or liked or desired. And, you know, you, it's like, as I say, it's like that moment you sit down with somebody and you, oh, that's, 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 that's somebody special. I remember with, with Mandela, Mandela came to the United States and he asked me to have a party for him in California when he just first arrived here. And I sat with him alone for whole afternoon. And I remember just him saying something, you know, that really kind of startled me, you know, really startled me about the fact that, um, his mission, his mission in life wasn't fulfilled. So he always knew he was going to be free because his mission wasn't fulfilled. And I said to myself, well, that's odd. You know, your, your mission meant you could forego all the burdens and the vicissitudes of life and all the things because you knew that was your mission. And he said, yes, I knew, I knew, I knew it. And when, and I said to him, and we talked about how, he, when he was, got the news about his being released, and, and I thought to myself, this is this guy's magic. I mean, it's like you were in the room with him and, and, and you thought to yourself, I just want to roll around on the floor with a guy because he just has that, he just has that right. special thing that that is there. And and it's and it's great, whether it's an artist, whether it's a performer, or and you're lucky enough to be around those people. Ali, Muhammad Ali was like that, you know, and uh he was you, you're with him. I was the several films of them and you're with him and he looked in the eye and he said to you what he meant, what he meant and what he said. And you know, he was aligned. You knew that he just had his whole coherence. His body was coherent with his mind, with his heart, with his feet, with his tongue. And you felt special and you knew he was mission driven. So that's what you look at, you know, is, is somebody mission driven. And uh, I, you know, I have a picture. I don't know if I can tell you this. I have a picture. 50 years ago of me, I have it in my pocket here on my phone, just by accident, I had it. Standing like this with Muhammad Ali when we made The Greatest, 
50 years ago, like this, the same picture. 50 years later, I have a picture taken two weeks ago with George Foreman, who came to the set, going like this. And remember, Ali knocked out Foreman. 50 yep. years later, and I'm still taking this picture. And I put the two pictures together and I said, wow, I just can't believe that. My life was like that. Just went 50 years like, like that. But those experiences were so incredible. Ali and this guy was so incredible that you knew your life was magical when you had those opportunities. More than the films, just those opportunities to connect with those, like you said, who you met with those kinds of people. Ali was unbelievable guy. Unbelievable. You're giving us 25, 30 minutes. It's amazing. So I have just a, a question I wanted to ask you that um, I consider you um, a great investor. Um, you're an author, you're an educator, you're a motivational person for me, somebody I have followed for years. Um, inspiring. But at some level, you've invested in really good films and really good people. You're, you you invest in human capital, physical capital. Right. Uh, you know, the Dodgers, Chavez Ravines, like real estate capital. Really, that's, that's the jewel of that whole thing is where the stadium's at. You got uh, it. <laughs> so... I have always said with technology, I invest in technology that replaces something or is more efficient than what I'm using. Yes. Uber is a great example of, I want a glass of wine. It replaces my car at a reasonable price. Zoom, DocuSign, more efficient than alternatives. Bitcoin, I'm the last person on Amer in America that doesn't buy Bitcoin. It does not replace my money. It's unregulated currency. It's too volatile and turbulent for me. When you look at something like cryptocurrency, where many of the most brilliant people, Mark Cuban, Elon Musk, are in, and I think to myself, I know they're smarter than me, but this doesn't align with my values or my beliefs. What do I do with that? Where do I take that? Well, it, it causes you some agita, so you probably take some tums with it when you, when you have it. You know? I'd start with that. But the, the, the honest question to that, honest answer to that question is, if something is out there and it's happening, instead of being, I'm not saying you, me too, instead of being critical, be curious. Hmm, that's interesting. What does it mean? And keep being curious. Because crowdsourcing, the crowd is very wise, whether it's the stock market or, or, or anything. The crowd, the wisdom of the crowd, the size of the crowd, now they can be fooled and things can happen in a bad, but it's, it, it's good to look at. So you have to say, hmm, that's interesting. What does it mean? Keep being curious about it. Doesn't mean you have to take all of your money out of your piggy bank and invest it in crypto. That would be insane, even if you thought it was worth it. What you do is you look at those things and say, what does it mean? How does it operate? Just keep being curious, look at, talk to people until you get comfortable. And then even if you get comfortable with things, whether it's a movie for me or a sports team, I listen, I bid on Chelsea last, uh, last week for five of us. Yeah, five of us bid, we came in second. Thank God I came in second after I found out what was gonna cost. I'm glad I came in second. But the point is the curiosity shouldn't be because you don't know the answer shouldn't stop you from being curious. That's what you got to watch out for. Just be, you don't want to, you don't want to assert your superiority over something. You want to see what it's telling you, not what it's asking you. It's telling you that a lot of people believe that the, our currency is too speculative or our currency is too dangerous. Our currency is overblown. A lot of people are telling that. And now they're in this currency, you know, so you, 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 you use it as a tool to learn and 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 not, I I don't think you'd be and you I don't mean you but one should be intimidated by not knowing the answer. But you should be intimidated by is not looking for what the answer could be, what it could mean. Still being curious, still being open to looking at it. You don't have to finalize your position on it. You know, um, some people still like the smell of horses to go from one town to the other, but you know, it's not, it's no longer practical. So the <laughs> idea is, I think the idea is, mm, there's something happening out there. What does it mean? Talk to a lot of people. Just I, I, Listen, I have scripts that come in. I think I read it and I'd say, this is dreadful. I don't understand what it's about. And I give it to other people, younger people, different people. And they read, oh, this is great. This is wonderful. And I have to 
surrender my my own opinion to to listen to think what am i missing they're different people they're different audiences and the same with players and the same with teams you know I, I i you know i've gone through it so much that you know that you know you know that winning 12 games a year in basketball when you have that kind of a payroll is really scary i mean it gives you sphincter arrest all of your sphincters go like this <laughs> because it's scary but what does it mean? It means, okay, a new beginning. I got to reboot. I got to rethink. In other words, so you have to have some kind of an attitudinal tool because bad crap happens, bad stuff happens and things you don't know happens. So you got to think about how to cope with it, how to deal with it. And so success as many fathers and failure as an orphan. So what you want to do is you want to honestly own the process of learning and growing from it, whether it's a movie or a television show or a sports team, it's, it's your life. And I can tell you as an older guy, it's like that. It goes that fast. You can remember when you were in high school. I'll bet you could remember when you were in high yep. school. It was like, was that yesterday? And so what you want to do is you want to be engaged in the process of your life, whether it's a sports vehicle or a team or a movie or a television show, this is your life. And so you want to be, interested in it, not just try to be interesting, but interested in engaging in it. And I think that the entertainment business, the business you're in and I'm in, where we talk with and to people and we and we and we design our products to engage them emotionally. People love that emotional transportation. That's why they love sports. That's why they love movies. They love that emotional transportation. Nobody wants to sit and listen to seven and two, it's nine and nine and 11. This thing, that, that, that door, the train came in on time. They turn that station off. They are engaged in that process of being alive. And I think that's what sports do. And I think that's what movies do. That's why I like it so much. It's, it's, it's a testament to human beings and that we love the process. We love winning and losing. There'd be no, winning wouldn't be a joy unless you face losing. There'd, there'd be no joy. Yeah. If, if you won every single one, you'd get bored. If you made every single movie was a hit, you'd get bored. So the idea is you got to cope with losing. You got to cope with winning. And if you can't do that, yeah, you should go into, you should go work with Putin. You know, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you can't, you, you got to manage that. So that's the fun. I look at it and people say to me, are you done with movies? I said, should I stop now? Really? Should I stop now? Are you done with sports? Are you stop now? We're all, you know, we're all driven by different demons and different benefits. And I look at it, I feel so lucky that I could be here with you. I've known you a long time and talk to you and, and, and I've listened to you and I enjoy it. If, and, and I, you're, you're an irascible so you're, you're always you're always you're always tweaking the cat. You're always pulling the dog's tail. You're always getting the, the, that animal to walk you know carefully by you. So I like I like that. I like that. I like being entertained by you. If you just gave me the score of the game, I would never turn you on. I said they won five to two. Nobody cares. They don't care. <laughs> How? Why? What happened? What? What was the reason? What did they do right? What did they do wrong? You give it emotional transportation. You give it propulsion. And that's the business you're in. And that's the business I'm in. We like, you know, we like that engagement with our audiences. We like people to say, no, I don't agree with you. And this is the reason why you go, well, that's not a bad idea. So that's what you have to cope with. So I like that in the movie business, television business, and sports business is super charged with that. It really, it, it, it really is. So, okay. And that's the thing we chose. Get back to Matt Damon and Ben Affleck. I'm They're going to say, Peter, where'd you go? And you said, I'm talking to this cowherd guy. He's really irascible. And they're like, oh, yeah, they're from Boston. They'll be like, yeah, he rooted against the Celtics. <laughs> what a pleasure, Peter. Thank you so much. Thank you.